Okay, so hi everyone. Um, welcome to the first distinguished lecture as part of SCCS Vigyan Vidushi. And it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Neildhara Mishra to deliver the first lecture. Professor Mishra is the Srimati Amba and Sri V.S. Shastri Chair Associate Professor at IIT Gandhinagar in Computer Science and Engineering. Prior to this, she was an Inspire Fellow at the Department of Computer Science and Automation at IASC, and she did a PhD at IMSC before that. Her current research interests, um, she likes to explore the boundaries of what can be computed efficiently and what can't, so particularly in parameterized complexity, and I think she part of that will form, uh, will be part of this talk as well. And I'd also like to add, so if you're interested in CS or uh, science communication, science teaching, her Twitter is a great place to look up any of these topics. Um, but yeah, uh, Neelara, please go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Among. Uh, this is uh, an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, and it's really wonderful um, to have an opportunity uh, to talk to you all. So um, thank you very much to the organizers for having me. Uh, it's, um, it's really a privilege. And with that, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about games of pursuit and evasion. I realize this is the last talk after a long day, so I'm going to keep this hopefully fun, fairly light. And uh, Umang has promised me he'll let me know when I should stop talking, so, <laughs> so hopefully um, keep track of time as well. Um, all right, so I'm going to actually uh, start off with a bit of a warm-up just to get a sense of what kind of games we are talking about. I realize you have a whole week of game theory coming up, but we are going to be talking about the kind of games people actually play. So I'll talk about the fun kind of games and you'll do the serious stuff next week, I guess. So, uh, sorry, slightly accusatory, but okay. So I'm going to start off with the game of Sim. Uh, this is a game that we play on graphs and just, uh, uh, just, just to clarify, uh, the kind of graphs that we will be talking about throughout our graphs is in entities and relationships, and not graphs is in uh, plots, things like that. Um, so, the, so the game of sim is played on what we call a complete graph, which is a collection of vertices with all possible edges between them. And uh, there are two players in this game. So um, it's a turn-based game. And so, so every every game has uh, rules, and uh, the the rules here are that uh, each player identifies with a color, and on their turn they have to pick an edge and color it with their color. There are no um, there are no passes, so you can't pass your turn. And <clears throat> the first player who is um, forced. Uh, to complete a monochromatic triangle uh, as the player that loses the game. So you want to avoid creating a triangle where all the edges have the same color. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a couple of pointers where you can find out more about this game, but I think the best way to get the hang of it is to just play it. Officially, the game of Sim is played on six vertices, but just to sort of get some practice, let's play it on four vertices here. Um, I don't know if uh, somebody wants to play this with me, perhaps. Um, any volunteers? Just You just have to identify. Okay, so the first player is the blue player. Um, the first edge, I guess it doesn't matter so much. The complete graph is completely symmetric. So we could start anywhere. We're going to start off with this diagonal edge here. Which edge would you want to play as the red player? The top one, okay. All right. Um, okay, I'm um, going to play the other side. Which edge would you want to play? The bottom one, okay. Great, so uh, now I am going to play this and you have only one edge left and this is a draw, okay. Um, is there a way that either of us can force the other person into completing a triangle? That's sort of what we want to think about. Or do you think... Or do you think if you play reasonably, then this game always ends in a draw? Like tic-tac-toe, I'm sure experienced players of tic-tac-toe uh, don't lose at tic-tac-toe, I guess, right? So, uh, is this uh, is this one of those is this one of those games, or uh, can you actually force 
let's see if we can do this again. Okay, does, does anybody want to just do another round maybe? So I'll take the top edge this time. Um, what do you want to play? And just think about if you have like a running strategy at the back of your mind. So, uh, okay, you take the diagonal. Um, so it's going to be, uh, I guess it's going to be a little bit dangerous for either player to have uh, just for demonstration. Uh, if you have two edges that are adjacent to the same vertex, then uh, you're blocked out of this edge. Um, it's a slightly dangerous move to play, but I think with just four vertices, it's it's probably not so bad. So um, I can still get away without getting trapped into a corner. And basically, see that. Um, can you see what structures the red edges and the blue edges are forming? Uh, are subgraphs parts parts of land three parts on three vertices that's uh sorry parts on three edges uh, four vertices so it, the the game has essentially in, in this play has decomposed the graph into um essentially two two parts uh you just have to unravel this one a little bit but it's also a path on on three edges um and let you think about whether you can always draw this game or not uh maybe let's just up the stakes a little bit and play this with five vertices instead of four. So um, again, just get some practice. Um, that's my first move. So anybody want to volunteer a suggestion for what, what you want to play here? The top edge, okay. All right, maybe I'll go with that one. What do you want to play now? Okay, which one, the top diagonal or the bottom one? Okay, like this one here? Uh, you can, I don't know. Okay, all right, this one, like way down here? Okay, cool. Like, I'm not gonna trick you <laughs> into completing a triangle by misreading your inputs, but okay, so um, cool. I'll take this one, seems safe, okay. Um, The bottom edge to the, okay. Uh, this one. No. Okay, this one. Fair. Okay. Cool. Um. All right. Okay. What now? Okay, the bottom one. Okay. All right, let's let's do the bottom edge. No? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so for those of you who want to play the bottom edge, why do you want to play the bottom edge? Yes. So if you, yes. So if you if you choose the bottom edge, then no matter which edge I play, I'm stuck with a blue triangle. Do you see that? So let's go ahead and uh, play the bottom edge. And now if I if I take the diagonal, that's a blue triangle. And if I take the straight edge, that's a blue triangle as well. Okay. So that's that's game over for the blue player. Okay. Cool. No. Oh, that. Oh, that. Okay. No, no, no. The person who who completes a, a monochromatic triangle loses. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I'm sure you're a skilled player of sim, but you just had the rules. <laughs> All right. Um, Okay, so let's continue to think about whether um, you know whether you can uh, whether you can force a win uh, like you did uh, here. But if you uh, was that because uh, there's actually a strategy that always works, or was that just because um, 
I'm uh, an idiot and I don't know how to play this game properly, right? Because there's two scenarios. Uh, it's possible that it, if I played smarter, then you couldn't have cornered me into a triangle, right? Okay. All right. Let's play this on six vertices, which is the original version of the game. And um, all right, do you guys want to start this time? Maybe, maybe Red is the luckier player, so. <laughs> okay, so let's name the vertices, that's a good point. Um, so maybe we call them, so I don't know how visible this is, but let's just call them, so it's not very imaginative, but we'll just go, clockwise and alphabets, right? So that's fine. Uh, ED is the bottom edge, AB is the top edge. Okay, okay. so, all right. So you insist I play first, so I take the diagonal. What do you wanna play now? B, E, okay. Fancy edge, the other diagonal, okay. Right? The other diagonal, yeah. All right. My turn. Um, okay. I've practiced all night for this, guys, so I was just saying. <laughs> okay, F FC. Okay, so that's that's the that's the edge across the center edge. Okay. Cool. Take this one. C E. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I wasn't that CE. <laughs> okay. A or uh, AF. Okay. AF. Are you sure? That's. Okay. So I'm hearing AF. I'm not hearing any objections. Lock idea. AF, okay? There's just one edge that you have to be careful about. I'm not telling you which one. <laughs> um, okay, what should Oh yeah, so there are like a lot of these smaller triangles that don't count, okay? So the only triangles that matter are the ones that you make with the vertices of the base graph, okay? So a lot of other triangles that you see in these puzzles that come up about counting triangles, you don't have to worry about them. Is that a suggestion for me? As it was my turn. <laughs> Okay. Okay, CE. Yeah, that, that triangle is not counted, yeah. I mean, if that's what you were worried about, yeah, that's not counted. Okay. B, B what? A -E. Okay. A E everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, damn. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
BF B BF or BF okay done kya very confident hai koi to yeah I think you're probably right, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, excellent. You're actually done. I mean, I thought you'll be done in the next step, but you're actually done. Okay. All right. So every every remaining edge is a... एक सेकेंड तुम क्यों टेंशन ले रहे हो टर्न मेरा है ना मतलब इट्स इट्स माय टर्न all right it's it's my turn and um, and i'm losing again um <laughs> so much for the practice okay um let's assume i'm pretty sure it's my turn because i think there are more red edges than blue edges so uh so you've played more turns than me and right now actually every black edge is completing a blue triangle so kis ne bola tha we're done pehle wo sahi bola actually i i i only i was only tracking the top one so i thought you'll force me in the next move but apparently not okay all right so um for a complete graph on six vertices um can you think about if it's possible for the game to end in a tie okay all right I actually suggest we put this to the vote. Let's see, I don't know why. Should be able to change slides, one sec. All right, can you just uh, take a break? And uh, everyone who has a phone or a, or a device, if you could, I'm just curious about what you think about these three games that we just played. So a couple of questions. One is, can you, can you force a win? right and the other question is uh especially for six vertices is it possible that the game even ends in a draw and maybe it may or may not be related to something that you already know what does it mean for the game to end in a draw what does the what does the uh, coloring look like so let's suppose that we played the game on six vertices right and the game ended in a draw that means that you have a two coloring of the complete graph on uh, on six vertices <laughs> <laughs> all right so you have a you have a two coloring of the complete graph on k vertices so that there is no there is no monochromatic triangle so do you is is that possible that's something to think about Okay, if you missed the code, it's still on top. You can enter that code to participate. All right, so most of you think that on four vertices, you can force a draw. Both players can force a draw or um, an optimal play will end in a draw, I think is the right way of saying it. Um, what does the first player do to ensure that he doesn't lose the game, he or she? Let's see. So let's go back here. 
So this is the simplest version of the game that we have seen. And most of you believe that the game should end in a draw. So let's think of it from the point of view of the first player. Um, what should the first player do to not lose the game? You can, can you always pick two opposite edges though? So in your first move, you pick one and you want to pick an opposite edge in the next move, but that can be blocked. Um, but okay, um, all right, I'm losing even without, okay, this is <laughs> even without trying, <laughs> it's, just, it's just terrible, <laughs> but okay. Um, the, the first two moves are never going to be dangerous because you cannot, I mean, even if somebody like me was playing, I cannot create a triangle with two edges, okay? So even I can't lose with two moves, but it's the third moves that you have to be careful about. So, um, so all right, so I guess you cannot, you cannot necessarily force parallel edges, okay? But even if you're forced into picking two edges that are adjacent to a common vertex, right? You will still not lose. Why is that? Mm -hmm. there's, there's always an option, right? Because when it's your turn, there's still going to be two edges remaining just by counting. And only one of them will be the dangerous edge. You can always pick the other one. Yeah, so, all right. So I think even I cannot lose this one, but in this case, it just, for the record, the red player <laughs> lost once. <laughs> Just saying. Um, all right. So that's uh, so the first player can always force a draw. Uh, what about the second player? Okay. Sorry that the slides are a bit awkward, but all right. So it seems like most of us have. Um, voted. What about what about the version with five players and also um, still curious about what happens with what happens with just four vertices from the point of view of the second player? Somebody was talking about opposite edges at some point. Um, I don't know if you can convert that into some sort of a strategy. Okay. It's just the confidence from the examples that we did for you guys. <laughs> okay. Um, so just to be sure, the question is not like, can the second player win some game? Is can the second player always win every game? Okay, there's a difference <laughs> between, between those two questions, okay? So, so. Okay, what about the second player with four vertices? So what's the strategy? So remember when we just played last time, the second player actually lost. So, so you do have to be careful. As I think you could be cut over, but you'll be okay. You, you do have to play carefully. Um, but I mean, natural strategies would include either uh, a diagonal and a side, okay? Um, yeah, I guess, um, I, uh, well, I was also gonna say maybe you can take, so once an edge has been played, there is an opposite edge. Um, I, I, I don't know if you think it's desirable to pick the opposite edge. It's one, because that way you, I mean, Intuitively, when you pick the opposite edge, you leave more room for the other player to complete triangles, right? I mean, when you when you coincide here, you're actually helping the blue player in some sense, right? But um, yeah, so, so now the blue player is forced to sort of be in the situation where they have to pick an edge that's incident 
to the endpoints of one of the uh, to, to the edge that they have already picked. So, all right. So that's that's the blue player. Now, what should the red player do now? One of the okay. What's what's the def difference, and why do you prefer one over the other? Okay, you right. Okay, so I see. Right, so okay. Uh, so what you're saying is, if I pick this edge, for example, it's better because. You know, you you are participating in a triangle, and uh, that's already not a monochromatic triangle, right? So now red cannot form a triangle anymore. That's a good point. Yeah, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. So I mean, I'm not going to try and like make this formal, but I'm sure you can um, convince yourself that both players can force a draw when there are only four vertices involved. For five vertices, it seems like there is more support for the second player, which is interesting. Uh, what about what about when there are six vertices? Okay, so some of you think that this game can actually be drawn, and I claim that no matter how you play this game, it's impossible for the game to end in a draw. Okay, so some player is going to win, and um, again, just in the interest in, in interest of time, I'm going to leave this as a bit of a puzzle. But um, if you think about what the color configuration looks like if the game ended in a draw, then basically you'd be in a situation where you have the edges of a complete graph on six vertices being colored with two colors with no monochromatic triangles, okay? And if you think about that, that's actually not possible. That's combinatorially not possible, okay? Um, you could start, for example, at any one of the vertices and look at the five edges going out of it. Um, and some three of them must be the same color, right? Fair. Some three of them must be the same color because if not, then you have two blue and two red, and there's an edge that's like in some quantum state or something. Okay, that's uh, that's not possible. So there must be three edges that have the same color. Now you focus on those three edges and you look at the other three endpoints. Okay, so let's say there are three blue edges coming out, and if any one of these is blue, then then it's a blue triangle. And if none of these are blue, then it's a red triangle, yeah? So you cannot be in a situation where you avoid a monochromatic triangle. The challenge is to think about which one is the one that gets forced, okay? And let's look at, um, all right, so for some reason, my slides refuse to transition, sorry about that, but. Okay, it's a pretty even split between the first and the second player. And this actually reflects the state of the literature in the sense that, um, okay, spoiler alert, there is a strategy for, I believe, the second player, but nobody knows how to sort of explain the strategy in a way that can actually be played by a human. So when this game is played in practice on pen and paper, and you guys can try it out, um, it's really anybody's guess, okay? so. You know, anybody can win in practice, although there is a very complicated strategy for the second player. So that's um, at least the current state of the art around sim. And now that we have a sense of what, you know, games on graphs might look like, let, let me actually get to an example of the sorts of games that I said I will talk about per set innovation, which is somebody is chasing and somebody is running. OK, 
Okay, so it's a lot of fun. It's just like in the movies, uh, you have two players, cops and robbers. Um, so the version that I'm going to talk about is a turn-based game and it has perfect information and everything is sort of deterministic and it's still very interesting. Okay, so everybody knows everything and uh, it's still going to be, uh, I think, non-trivial. So in the first move, the cops figure out where they want to stand in the graph, okay? So for now, let's just think about a situation with one cop and one robber. That's the sort of simplest kind of scenario to imagine. So the cop, the cop figures out where he wants to be, and the robber then figures out where they want to be, and then the chase begins, so to speak. So uh, everybody makes a move on their turn. You have to move along an edge. So if you are at a particular vertex in the current round, when it's your turn next, you can only go to a neighboring vertex. You cannot just fly anywhere in the graph. Um, the robber wins if they can keep running around and keep the cop chasing forever. And um, if uh, that's not the case, and the cops can actually corner, in this case, a single cop can corner the robber, then uh, it's a cop win. Okay, so a graph is called a cop win if one cop is enough to corner the robber. So that's sort of a, a basic definition in this uh, in this context. So maybe let's, yeah. Okay, that's a great question. So the two versions of the game, the active and the passive version. So um, let's, uh, by default, I'm talking about the passive version where if you want, you can pass. But the active version is one where you're forced to, forced to make a move every step. And it's actually a fun puzzle to figure out uh, an instance of the game where both versions have different outcomes, which is to say, if the robber is forced to make a move at every turn, then the cops can actually corner him. But if he had the opportunity to stay put, then he could actually win something like this. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is a messy example. Let's just look at these um, simpler examples. So if you, if your graph is just a path, is it a cop win? Yes. Okay. Why? So let's say, um, the cop starts wherever. Where should the robber start, you think? Okay, the robber shouldn't start next to the cop. That's the worst possible place to start, okay? Um, so one option is, so, okay, you can probably already see that the robber has no hope on the path, okay? But if he just wanted to maximize his time out of jail, where, where should he be? The last vertex, right? Okay. So as far away from the cop as possible. And now it's not particularly interesting. The robber should just stay put. Otherwise, he's just getting closer to um, a not so nice future. But in that many turns, the cop will eventually catch the robber. Okay. So, uh, so the robber is kind of stuck. This is a cop win. What about a cycle? The cop starts wherever. Where should the robber be? Yeah, it doesn't matter except for the two vertices that are adjacent to the cop, right? That would be like, yeah, uh, that would be pushing your luck, but anywhere else is fine, okay? So, um, and now you can just imagine what happens next, right? So, yeah. Yes, so this is perfect information. Everybody knows everything. They know the structure of the graph. They know where they are. And um, yeah, that, that is the case, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, so the, the, the cop is going to try and chase the robber down, but because it's a cycle, they're just going to go in circles forever, literally. Um, all right, so. All right, I just have to. All right, so let's, uh, we've already discussed, uh, we've already discussed this. So um, which of these graphs is a cop win, a path, a cycle, a complete graph, and a tree? So what is a tree? A tree is a connected graph that does not have a cycle in it. So a path is a special kind of a tree. I hope you're able to select multiple options. Oh, okay, that's... Oh, that's a shame. Okay. So, all right. So uh, forget about the path and the cycle then because we've already discussed it. Um, 
between, um, okay, so a complete graph, is that a Cochrane? It's a complete graph, like the cop chooses a place to be. Is there any place that the robber can hang out and feel safe? No, right? So it's uh, it's an extreme sort of a cop win graph, right? The, the robber has no chance, like it's not even going to survive one round. Yeah? Okay. So a complete graph is clearly a cop win. Uh, what about a tree? Uh, it can be if, uh, what? If they're along the same branch, okay. So this is like a, this is an unrooted tree, right? So you can always make it the same branch, right? So just grab the tree where the cop is standing and shake it from there. And there's always going to be like a path, a direct path to the robber. Um, well, at least that's to convey some intuition, uh, but I don't know if you can actually turn that into an argument that a tree is a cop win. Yeah, yeah. It will be a cop win, okay. Um, so, uh, and why, why again do you think it's a cop win? Okay, and okay, so essentially the fact that, well, I mean, again, at a very high level, the fact that there are no cycles means that once you get into the sort of a branch or a subtree, you're kind of, you know, your fate is sealed in that subtree. You cannot jump to a different subtree because there's like no exit of that sort. Okay, again, all of this can be like, I promise you written up uh, properly, but um, at least hopefully there's some intuition that our trees are also uh, cop wins. And in fact, I think we will see a more general way of identifying cop win graphs, which kind of cements this intuition. So that's a natural question, right? If I give you a graph, like the first one from here, like if you had to look at this and tell me, is this a cop win? Okay, <laughs> all right. I was going to say it'll take some time, but somebody already <laughs> figured it out. So, um, but okay. Um, it does look like a very cycly, cycly graph. And it looks like the robber can probably give the cop a chase around some of these perimeters. But you can imagine that if it's a messy sort of a graph, it's not, it's not completely obvious how you determine if, a graph is a cop win. Um, so there's also a sense in which this is a sort of a computational question as well. I give you a graph as input. I want a procedure that can determine if it's a cop win or not. Yes. Yes. So both the cop and the robber are allowed to pass their turns if they want to. Yeah. Yeah. And um, as I said, the the modalities of the game actually change if you change that rule. So, so the, the two games are actually distinct and uh, it's, it's nice to try and find an example that, that actually shows this, yeah. Okay. All right, so um, let's, okay. So, so one thing is that you could of course try to do this in some brute force way where you try to explore all possible things that both players can do and so on and so forth. But um, uh, that's, that's going to be terribly inefficient, okay? You can imagine that the world of possibilities just keeps blowing up. Uh, you can think of some sort of a game tree where you try to sort of anticipate what's going to happen and is, is the combinatorial explosion involved there is uh, huge. So we don't want to, uh, we don't want to brute force this one. It's going to be very expensive. So here's a cute uh, sort of an idea that turns out to be helpful. So, if you have an edge uh, in the graph that, that sort of looks like this, I haven't labeled the vertices, but think of V as the red vertex, which is sort of the attack, um, and, um, and U as the green vertex, which is the pitfall, okay? So, um, so the notion of a pitfall is uh, every vertex that the green vertex is seeing, the red vertex is also seeing, 
okay? That's sort of the definition, and I'm just presenting this without, um, without motivation at the moment, because um, I think it's fun to think about why pitfalls are useful uh, for cops. So let's see. So imagine what happens in um, imagine what happens in the last round of a cop win graph, right? Uh, the cop has somehow managed to corner the robber into a place from where the robber has no exit. So wherever the robber wants to go, right, the cop can still get to him. So that's a vertex whose entire neighborhood is sort of contained in the neighborhood of the vertex that the cop is on. Yes, so that's kind of what's happening at the very, uh, what you might think of as the end game of a cop win graph, right? So, um, so if you do have a pitfall attack situation like we saw on the previous slide, um, does that imply that uh, the graph is a cop win, or is it the case that every graph that is a cop win must have such a situation, um, or both of them true? Is it true that a pitfall characterizes cop win graphs? So if that was true, if the existence of pitfalls characterized cop win graphs, then it's easy to uh, turn that into an algorithm for figuring out if a graph is a cop win, right? Because you just examine every edge, check if it's a pitfall. If you found one, then you could declare that the graph is a cop win, okay? Oops. Okay, so let's think about this. The existence of a pitfall implies a cop win. Can anybody come up with a graph which has a pitfall but is not a cop win? Exactly, yeah. You could have a pitfall in some corner of the graph, but the robber somehow manages to stay away from it. So you could have a cycle and you could have a even a degree one vertex coming out of it, like a leaf in a tree, right? So you have a degree one vertex coming out of it. So um, if the robber was on that degree one vertex and if the cop was on the vertex that's, you know, uh, from where the degree one vertex is sprouting on the on the cycle, then that's a, that's a pitfall attack situation. But the but this graph is not a cop win because the robber is never going to go there, right? The robber will not start on the pitfall. And once he's on the cycle, he's never going to get out and go into that pitfall because he can see it and he would know better than to go there. Okay. So the first statement, um, the the first statement is not true. In fact, right? The existence of a pitfall does not imply that the graph is a cop win. What about the idea that if the graph is a cop win, there must be a pitfall. Okay, this we have already discussed more or less. We said, look at the end game, look at the very last step, look at where the robber is and look at where the cop is. That combination is a pitfall attack situation. Yeah, so if a graph is a cop win, then there must be a pitfall in the graph. So you can go through your graph and if you don't find any pitfalls, like in a cycle, for instance, then you can conclude that it's a, it's a robber win, okay? But there may be a few more graphs that are robber wins. They have pitfalls, but the robbers can manage to avoid it, okay? So, all right, so I think um, I, I haven't, I don't have the statement here, but it turns out that here's something that you can do. Um, and again, uh, it's, it's a nice exercise to prove this. Um, if you find a pitfall attack situation, and if you delete the pitfall from the graph, then um, the status of the graph does not change. If it was a cop win before it stays a cop win, if it was a robber win before it stays a robber win, okay? So deleting pitfalls does not change anything. You can think about why that's true. So what you can do is successively delete pitfalls. And if you're left with just one vertex, then that's a cop win. 
but uh, if you aren't, then it's a problem. Okay. So, so it's not, I mean, just finding a pitfall is not enough to confirm that it's a cop win, but if successively removing pitfalls leads you to a single vertex, then it's a cop win. Okay. That's deleting the, deleting the vertex, which is the pitfall where you don't want to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And you have to, I think, be careful, if I remember correctly, about deleting them successively, as opposed to finding all the pitfalls and deleting them at once. So, uh, so you find one, you remove it, and then recursively find another and so on. So there is an efficient characterization for Copwin graphs. Um, so that brings us to the question of, what about the graphs on which the poor cops don't win? Um, when the robbers win, then perhaps we just need more cops to catch the robber. And this brings us to the notion of a cop number, which is the smallest number of cops that you need to unleash on this graph to make sure that you can nab the robber, which is something you want to do. Okay. Um, and let's think about uh, cop numbers. I think on your screens, you should be seeing this picture. Um, this is called a, a, a dodecahedron graph or something. Um, and um, let's just think about, okay, uh, you can probably go through this and confirm that there are no pitfalls. So it's a robber win. One cop is not enough. One cop is not enough to catch a robber on this graph. Uh, but now you could ask follow-up questions. Are two cops enough? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So in this version, both cops are allowed to move one step simultaneously. There is a version called lazy cops, where it's just one cop. <laughs> the thing about cops and robbers is that somehow it's so intensely studied that almost anything you think of is bound to be somebody who has like a couple of papers <laughs> about that variant. I mean, I, at least this is, uh, this is my impression from just looking at it a little bit. Um, okay, so we have a few comments about this graph. Um, and, um, and again, I'm sorry if you are not able to select multiple answers because it's not the intention, but let's just go through, uh, go through the options here. Um, okay, there's no love for 10 are enough. Nobody thinks uh, 10 are enough? Can you think of like an initial position for 10 cops that, that will completely block uh, the robber? Okay, uh, the star uh, in the center, okay. That's... So uh, why does the star in the center uh, work? So if you place cops in sort of the middle ring, so to speak, uh, what's the dynamics? What happens? What can you say about every other vertex in this graph? So, uh, so I hope the star in the center is clear. Maybe I do need that pointer. It's, uh, the star in the center is this thing here. Mm -hmm. Oh, with 10 cops. Okay, so one proposal was place the cops on the star. The other proposal is place them on the inner pentagon and the outer one. Uh, that's another way of doing it. Um, if, um, so for both of these solutions, what's the property of the set of vertices on which you are placing the cops that ensures that the robber loses? Yeah, exactly. Every other vertex that does not have a cop on it is connected by a direct edge to some vertex that has a cop on it. Okay. So such a subset of vertices is called a dominating set. Some of you may have encountered this notion before. So if you have a dominating set, what that means is that every vertex in the graph 
is either in the dominating set or it's outside it, but it has a neighbor in the dominating set. So dominating sets are great for cops because they just hang out in the dominating set and the robber cannot do anything, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, so I should take my statement back about every variant having been studied. I'm I'm not sure that I've seen one with uh, multiple robbers um, and multiple calls. I, I, yeah, it definitely makes sense um, to try and catch at least one. There is a game um, called Greedy Spiders, which has spiders and flies. It's like a game on Play Store. Um, and it has a very similar flavor to this kind of pursuit evasion. And there you could argue that there are many robbers and many cops and they're trying to. Uh, so there I think you win if you can catch even one of the robbers. But you can also imagine having a more stringent winning criteria where you want to catch all of them. Um, so yeah, I think all of those variations sort of make sense. Yeah. All right. So. Um, so I think we agree that 10 cops are definitely enough uh, because there's a dominating set of size 10 if you want to. Uh, uh, okay, so there's a solution with five. Oh yeah, there is apparently a solution with three. Uh, and uh, that's apparently, I, okay. Uh, let me just figure out. Yeah, so I, I believe the cop num the actual cop number is three. I don't have an argument for how three cops will manage, but I think we can argue that two cops are not enough. So that's um, so I wanted to say that <laughs> some very ambitious votes for saying that two cops are enough, uh, but it turns out that two cops uh, actually cannot catch a robber on this gap. On, on this graph, um, and it turns out the three are enough. Um, and I think the fact that three are enough is because three cops are enough, I think, on any planar graph, and this is planar, uh, has something to do with, um, uh, it has something to do with properties of planar graphs that can be exploited. So um, I, I, yeah, I don't have like an explicit strategy for three cops here or, or even five for that matter. So that's, I think, good food for thought. Speaking of food, I think we have, I'm just saying, <laughs> okay, we have maybe five, 10 minutes. <laughs> right, so you're saying position the five cops initially on the, on the in, innermost innermost pentagon to begin with and then um and then have them all move to the next layer okay right so if all the cops are on the inner pentagon then the uh, then the robber cannot be in the in sort of the second layer although i'm not sure if the robber can be at a vertex here and uh, somehow make his way back in, I don't know if that makes sense. So from the inner pentagon, I guess the cops can come out here. If the robber is initially here, and then after the cops choose to come out, the robber sort of tries to find some sort of an escape this way. I'm not completely sure, but we could. Once the, robber, once the cop moves to the outer, the pentagon, yeah. the robber is forced to go to the outermost shell. Uh, yes, yes, that is correct. It's forced to go to. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I see that the robber is forced to go outside. Um. I I thought it can sort of make a comeback, but okay. In the meantime, the cops have come to the to the other five uh, vertices of the of the star. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, so I hadn't quite thought about that. So five five cops are explicitly enough, and um, you need more than two. So um, so that's that's how much. So do you need three, four, or five? Is the question that um, that that you can think about? Um, I I will briefly tell you about why you need. Um, why you need at least uh, why you need at least two um, 
it turns out that if, okay, if the shortest cycle in a graph has more than four vertices, which is the case here, as you can see. Um, okay, sorry. I think I need to pull this image up. Um, so you can see that there are no cycles of length. There's certainly no triangles and there are also no four cycles, okay? So every cycle has five vertices, at least five vertices. Um, in such graphs, it turns out that you actually need at least the minimum degree. So the minimum degree, the degree of a vertex is the number of neighbors it has, okay? And you need at least that many cops. And again, I'll not like I'll not try to prove this formally, but I hope to maybe just say that th this is intuitive, because when you don't have uh, when you don't have degree many cops, right? So every every vertex in this graph has degree at least three, right? In fact, yeah. So every every vertex is three neighbors. Okay. So if you have only two cops, no matter where the robber is standing, at most two of its neighbors have cops on them. So there is an edge from which it can sort of escape, okay? And more generally, you're using the fact that there are no triangles or four cycles to say that one cop cannot guard two locations simultaneously on your neighborhood, okay? So because there aren't any short cycles. And, and one cop, so when you're in the neighborhood and you go here, another cop cannot attack you from the neighborhood because that would mean there is a triangle, okay? So that's kind of the intuition. So you need more than two cops. And... Um, you need at most five, and we'll leave it at that, but there's a more general result about planar graphs needing only three cops, which you can apply here to say that the cop number is three. And if you're interested, that's a nice result, I think, to look up. Um, okay, so, um, uh, okay, so it's the cop number well-defined, I think that's an easy one to answer. Uh, you can, of course, always uh, place cops on all the vertices if you really wanted to. We already said, that in fact a dominating set is enough, so that's fine. Um, another question that's interesting to think about is if the cop number can grow arbitrarily in the number of vertices, and then what is you know what sort of a growth rate can you can you look at in whatever families of graphs? So, for example, can you have graphs where the number of cops is linear in the number of vertices? And I think the answer to that is actually in the negative, but there's like, there's definitely a, a fairly large gap there between what is known and um, uh, uh, what is uh, what we understand. So I think uh, you cannot have a cop, the cop number being as large as order of n, but I think what is, uh, what is known in terms of uh, uh, what is conjectured is that it only grows according to root n, and, and we don't know if that's true. There are graphs where you do need root n, but we don't know. Uh, so, so that's kind of the gap that's there here. So uh, yeah, connected graphs, yes. So we're only talking about connected graphs here, yes. Um, also, uh, if you've seen um, hypercubes, that's a nice example of a family of graphs where the cop number just keeps growing, okay? So a hypercube of dimension one, I guess, is sort of an edge. Uh, dimension two would be like a four cycle. Uh, if you want to get a hypercube of dimension n, you take two hypercubes of dimension n minus one and sort of draw a matching between them. That's what a hypercube is. And it's kind of a cute exercise to argue that the cop number grows according to something like n uh, n by two or something like this. So, so something that's a function of the number of vertices, okay? But um, yeah, so that's, Okay, so um, so that, that that's another nice sort of exercise. I wanted to just have some fun here. Maybe this will be like the last question that we do on this thing. Um, I wanna welcome variants of cops and robbers from all of you. So if you had to change the rules, we already heard about multiple robbers. If you had to change the rules of the game, um, what would be your variant of cops and robbers? I will tell you about some of the variants that people look at on the next slide, but I just wanted to see what thoughts you have. So you can speak it out, but if you can type it in, then it'll just come up here and it'll kind of be on the record, so.
like uh, you know, you see, you know, each player has got a one single color, right? Yes. So what if like a player has like say, two different colors again? Uh, yes. So I think. People do look at variations of the game where there are uh, the multiple colors is typically encoded by multiple players. So three players taking turns and there being three colors. Or you could just say that there are three colors and each player is free to choose any color from the palette. And whoever completes a monochromatic triangle loses the game. And um, I guess the forced draw theorems for these variants are simply related to these multi, I, I don't know what they're called, like the multi-dimensional Ramsey numbers, because this was essentially the R33, uh, six is essentially R33. So if you look at R333, which is 17 or something, uh, then uh, on K17, the game will never end in a draw, even if you have three colors. So, um, but I think the, yeah, so, so that map is fairly direct. So we can borrow results from, uh, Ramsey theory and what is unknown about Ramsey theory is correspondingly going to be difficult to draw conclusions from here as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right, let's take a look. Multiple cops uh, moving at the same time is, okay, so that's that's beyond cop win. Uh, it's, that's like the cop number, I think. Uh, cops and robbers can move at different speeds. So that's a great suggestion. Cannot trace back on a path, which really means that if you have already taken an edge some point, then you can't take it again. Um, allowed to take a K-length walk instead of just one step. Uh, two edges in one step, which is kind of related. Uh, Robert occasionally gets an invisible move like Scotland Yard. Okay, very cool. Um, total number of moves is fixed. Take more than step in one go. Two step jumps with no passes. So you mean you're forced to take two steps in every move? That would be interesting too. Um, uh, cops and robbers have different numbers of allowable steps. Some lazy cops. Cops and robbers don't know each other's moves. Yeah, I think that's a couple of people suggesting that. Uh, in fact, three suggestions for not knowing each other's moves. Um, <laughs> Robin requires K cops to nab him or her simultaneously. So <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, that's a uh, slightly violent suggestion, but okay, a valid one. Um, uh, okay. All right, let's assume that the cops can only move for the first case steps. What will be the minimum case such that a cop? So you're interested in minimizing the number of rounds the game lasts as well. Um, okay, like maze runner, the destination would be, so the robber is trying to get somewhere and the cops is trying to stop them from getting there. Okay, that's, that's also interesting. Th there is a paper, if you look for it, which has Romeo and Juliet in the title, which has a similar goal. It's not a robber get, trying to get somewhere, it's two people who are trying to meet. And then there is like, again, very filmy, there are these people who are trying to keep them apart. And again, turn-based game, um, absolutely fascinating stuff. All right, excellent suggestions, some which I, I hadn't thought of. So, uh, okay. Uh, so, so here's my list, which is also like just partially stolen from all over the place. So a drunk robber basically flips a coin um, and or whatever, tosses a die and decides which edge to take uh, uniformly at random or according to your favorite distribution. Uh, and then the, uh, well, I mean, so this is a stochastic version of the game. So you have to also adapt your notion of an end game and what are you looking for? You're trying to optimize the expected amount of time that it takes for you to catch the robber. So that's fairly well studied variant actually. Um, Lazy Cops is I think the version that Umang and some of you have mentioned, which is that you do have multiple cops, but only one of them can be sort of nudged into moving in every round. Um, cops on helicopters, which is that they're not constrained to move along the edges of the graph, which might sound funny because then like, what's the challenge? Because is just fly to where the robber is. <laughs> the rules are kind of funny. So the robber can see the helicopter coming and they can run away just before the helicopter lands. And this has like, yeah, again, uh, very dramatic, but it has, it has some really nice connections with um, sort of uh, graph parameters. Uh, it's like really neat results for the helicopter variant. Um, 
imperfect information. Again, some of you suggested that the cops and robbers shouldn't know each other's moves. And I think there's also like this various variation of chess, like I think it's called blind chess or something where you can see only like a part of the board that you're playing, not all of it or something. Huh? Oh, it's called <laughs> Okay, yeah, makes sense. So I think there are variations here that are like that. You can see like a R radius uh, around where you're currently standing, but you cannot see beyond. Um, and no information at all is also um, a variation that's studied. Uh, long range robbers, many of you suggested multiple steps. You could also have long range cops. Uh, you could also take this to graphs that are not necessarily finite. Uh, cops and robbers at varying speeds that you guys suggested also has been studied, I didn't put it here, but you can imagine this is a long list. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's basically a lot to sort of look at and explore and so on. Um, and I'm, I think, okay, so maybe I'll just quickly tell you about like just one more, um, one more game in this category. I'll not get into any details, but I'll just sort of, Tell you what the what the game looks like. Okay, so this is another sort of a attack defense sort of a game uh, where essentially um, you have again cops or guards that are sort of protecting the graph in this case, and you have an attacker that actually attacks the edges, and every time an edge is attacked. Uh, you need to have a guard go across the edge to clean up the damage, okay? And uh, the guards win if they can defend an infinite sequence of attacks, and um, the attacker wins if this is not the case, okay? So you need to have a strategy to move. So once a guard has moved across an edge, they can't come back, because if they could do that, then this question is not really interesting. So, uh, so once a guard... Uh, sort of defends an attack, they cannot come back, which means that they were probably also guarding some other edges out here, and maybe they left them vulnerable. So other guards have to sort of shift their positions to make sure that they're prepared for the next round of attack. Um, and so this, uh, for good reason, is called uh, the eternal vertex cover problem. Uh, if you know what a vertex cover is, you probably realize that the positions of the guards have to form a vertex cover. So vertex cover is essentially a subset of vertices which cover all the edges. So every edge has at least one of its endpoints in the vertex cover, which is exactly what you want here because you want every uh, attack to be defensible, right? So, uh, so this is essentially trying to is vertex cover on steroids. You want to know if you can, well, you have to start with a vertex cover and then you have to sort of uh, you know, morph it into another one in response to an attack and you have to keep going. So it turns out that, I mean, on, on some graphs, you may need more than what you need just for a vertex cover to be able to, you know, uh, to be able to defend attacks forever. And sometimes you don't need any extra guards, it's just the vertex cover, whatever the vertex cover number is, that many guards happen to be enough. So uh, so this is, um, again, a fun uh, question, fairly well studied, and uh, lots of interesting connections with vertex cover and, uh, and so on. So maybe I think, um, I mean, I also had a few slides on firefighting, which is basically a fire spreading to the graph and firefighters trying to block it and, you know, uh, trying to save as many vertices as they can. It's the other kind of Games on graphs. So games on graphs is like a whole subject. If you search, you'll probably find a course uh, at CMI. In fact, that's uh, that's taught on this uh, subject. So you'll find a lot of interesting references there. So speaking of, okay, so I think I had a simulation. Speaking of references, an entire book about cops and robbers games, uh, which is not, uh, it is reasonably recent, and uh, you'll find a lot of nice uh, sort of results here. This is. Uh, this is a fun video uh, on the PBS Infinite Series playlist. Uh, this is about cops and robbers, and there's like uh, a few more variations uh, that, that are covered here, so you might want to check this out. If you want to find out more about SIM and the connections with Ramsey stuff, uh, this is a really nice talk about it. Um, it goes into a lot more depth than uh, we did. Um, it's not a reference, but if anybody wants to come to IIT Gandhinagar, this 
uh, will hopefully tempt you. Uh, this is our latest uh, <laughs> latest video of the campus, so check it out. Uh, so yeah, you can sort of find these slides. And I think this might be like a good time to stop and invite any questions that you might have. So, all right, thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm yes, around. I'm around for the next few days as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we ask you a lot of questions, so you can look around the table. That's right. Let your play. Uh, yeah, so um, so that's like a website that's embedded in the slides. So it's kind of an iframe, but yeah, so you can play on the website. Yeah. So you can play the game on your website. Uh, yeah, I mean, in fact, if you just open up this link, you could you could play from within the slides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Box. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, that would be fascinating. I'm I'm not sure I've seen drunk cops yet, but um, yeah, I think I think a drunk robber and drunk cops would be like a very fun party. <laughs> robbers, a scheming robber. Right. Don't need much of the right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it would would definitely be interesting. Uh, yeah, not something I've come across specifically yet, but. Uh, I, I I will let you know if I find find anything. <laughs> uh, I don't think we online this question, but they can tell us. The, I'm not sure what the. Yeah. Um, questions over the audio feed are, are absolutely welcome. Yeah. So for games like Sims, so yeah. Like, uh, so for Sims itself, the strategy seems to be complicated. Right. But. Uh, is it known for larger? Yeah, I mean, I tried to find out briefly, but it seems like um, six was already uh, enough of a challenge. I don't know if there is a, I mean, maybe it's easy to say that. I, I, I think a winning strategy exists because the game doesn't end in a draw and it's perfect information. Uh, but about which player wins and if like a strategy can be. Uh, so this one, the one that is known is actually a computer aided proof. Uh, it's, uh, and, and from a while ago, I think actually could be getting the timeline mixed up, but probably from the 80s or so. Uh, so it's, it is it is it is an oldish result in that sense. And I'm not sure if, uh, uh, I'm not sure if more has been done on on like larger uh, graphs. Yeah. So I think all we know is that uh, that there is. I mean, one of the players will win, and there is a winning strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have two questions. One is that uh, you know, get into game theory, and the other one is what does game theory entail more than the games that you play? Oh, okay. Um. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, great question. I mean, I, I don't have a, a, don't think I have a good answer to the first one. I think I got into it because it's fun and that's pretty much it. Um, I think this, uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, you, you could argue that, um, I mean, some of these games, so for instance, games like firefighting actually model a lot of real world uh, problems. So uh, for instance, even the uh, 